We are at Basel World 2019, and I'm joined now by CEO of Breitling, George Kern. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Now, I, for me, I was here last year. The difference is quite obvious here in Hall 1, especially in the latter half. But for you, this is great. I <laughs> love it. I mean, uh, it's space. all about Breitling. <laughs> exactly. So you walk in, and you see us. And from our offices, we see into this uh, beautiful alley. It's like being, uh, you know, a uh, beautiful view, view from a hotel room on Fifth Avenue. This is it. <laughs> it is quite nice. The swatch has left a void, but like we said, you are, you are definitely on the long end of that stick. Speaking of which, why are you still here? Why do you still come to Basel World? Um, first of all, it was a commitment to the new management last year. Okay. Uh, when they joined, uh, we promised we would stay for one more year. Okay. Uh, waiting uh, to hear about their new ideas, uh, potentially a new concept, which, by the way, they introduced to us uh, 10 minutes ago. Oh! So this morning, uh, oh, wow. our first meeting was to understand more about uh, where they're going. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the challenge of any fair will be to accommodate, I would say, two axes. First of all, billionaires, mm -hmm. millionaire companies, and startups. And you have okay. to accommodate everybody so that nobody feels small uh, mm -hmm. besides you know, the big players. And I think right. that's very important. Okay. But they're going into the right direction. And then the second question is, do you need boost? Do you need a boost? Do you need to sell at the fair? And the question is, what formats yeah. should such a fair offer? And I think it should be a versatile uh, level of formats in order to accommodate people who are more fashion oriented or more um, mm -hmm. digitally oriented or really would like to, to, to have a hard for sales uh, cabin in their booth. Well, I mean, just off the top, it sounds like they're really trying to cover a wide spectrum. I mean, not only in, you know, the, the spectrum of the brands themselves from high end to a lower, well, not lower end, but more accessible end, but also the they gamut of retail. I think they have to, because one size doesn't fit at all. Uh, yeah. You have to have that flexibility. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's a must in order, as I said, to accommodate different needs. Right. Not every, the world is changing so much. The brands are so different. Mm -hmm. And you need to have different formats um, because not everything is applicable to every uh, brand. And I think it's they have space. Uh, you just need a little bit of imagination. And you feel like Mr. Loris Melikov has got this imagination? Um, I mean, we, did, we, we, we discussed with him, so we help him also in, in, uh, <laughs> in building new ideas. Okay. And we'll see what will come out in the next couple of weeks. But we will definitely... Um, give a statement on uh, the future of the fairs or summits, etc. And after, after that fair here in Basel. Okay, so it, it doesn't sound like you've made up your mind. Um, well, as I said, I just, just walked out of, yeah. of that meeting this morning, so... We need but do you feel good about it? Do you feel good about what you've heard? Do you feel positive? Um, there are some positive uh, signals. Okay. Um, but there's a long way to, to go, oh. so... I was wondering because you know with the starting of, the, of your summits, of your business summits, um, the first one was London, right? Just yes. end of last year, and now one here in, in Basel. Yeah, we had one in China too. And Hong one in, in Hong Kong, exactly. So, so the third one. I was wondering, do you already have one foot out the door of Basel World? Whatever happens, we will continue with summits. I think you need uh, the world is changing. I think mm -hmm. we need to be closer to the uh, uh, to the markets. I think having a presentation, and Apple did it, Steve Jobs did it, when he started you know, in an hour presenting everything, what is really important, which by the way, you can stream. Uh, you, you have to, to also embrace the digital world. And there's another huge issue with fairs is you present products and then they are delivered or shipped six, eight, 12 months later. And this is not acceptable. And the fashion industry showed us you have to go from the catwalk to the store because the first thing once you launch a product first thing you uh, on your social media is where can I buy it and when can I buy it and uh, that's another issue I don't think you can concentrate everything on one week and being able to ship the week after so what on, in our perspective from writing there will be different shows during the year and we will immediately ship after our summits okay all right and how much selling do you actually do at a fair like this? 
uh, I couldn't even tell you because we did pre-sales, but ah. I would say for the first uh, six months of the year, we probably uh, sold 50% of that volume already. Mm -hmm. But it's not relevant. A fair, mm -hmm. if one point is sure, a fair is not there for us to sell. I mean, we can sell, uh, you know, to, to, we can sell every day. We see our customers every day. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is to communicate with them, mm -hmm. is to explain them where we're going, and also to explain that to the customers through uh, digital platforms. So it's not it's not a sales platform. I don't consider, at least for Brightling, Basel or any fair in the world as being a sales platform. And in, in terms of these summits that you go to these different cities, I mean, that, it seems like more work rather than just concentrating on one location to disperse it out into different cities. I mean, certainly more work, but much more efficient. Okay. Much, much better results. It's sustainable then. It's a sustainable uh, model to do these uh, summits oh, over I'm, the... I'm absolutely convinced. I'm the one okay. suffering, but I'm paid for that. So um, it's fine. Okay. I have much more time to spend with the journalist, much more time to spend with the clients. How much time do I have here at the fair with my clients? It's 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And when I travel from country to country, which is two to four months a year, I'm close to them, I listen to them, I understand what the needs are. I see collectors, I see consumers, I see the press. It's super efficient, super tiring, but again, we're paid for that. I can imagine it's nice to be closer to the markets, so you know you have more access. And yeah. they love it. The retailers and the consumers, they love it. Mm -hmm. Because we have the dinners, we see, as I said, the collectors, the... And it makes sense. It's, it, it makes a lot of sense. And what about bringing these dates together, Basel World and SIHH? I heard a lot of rumbling in the ranks after this happened. How, um, how do you feel I about mean, it? Okay, a couple of comments on that. First of all, it's certainly the first right step in the right direction. Uh, but the problem, actually, we should have one fair in one spot during one period of time. Because what is going to happen, you will have uh, one week in Geneva, one week in Basel. So actually, people will come the last two or three days to Geneva and the two or three first days to Basel. So this is what is going to happen. So actually, they should sit down and, in my opinion, have one fair, which really would make sense. Right. Uh, and then with the different formats, I've mentioned earlier in order to accommodate different needs. Is that possible um, to do? Of course, if of course it's possible, mm -hmm. if uh, if there were less egos uh, in the whole debate. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. And you need yeah. lots of common sense to deal with that. And um, I think it's it's it makes sense. It's total common sense. But you know, in, in political life, Brexit, in many debates, <laughs> it's not of common sense. So here we are. Yes, many times you do ask yourself, what happened to common sense? Exactly. For you, it would be more convenient. I mean, you can just stay in Geneva. That would be nice. Whatever. We don't, we don't, uh, we can be in Hong Kong, we can be in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we live in a world of, uh, um, <laughs> of exchanges and, and um, it, we don't care where we are. Yesterday when I spoke to Michel, um, he told me that Basel World, you were just in Hong Kong. Basel World is also planning to do a version of that, Basel World Hong Kong. I mean, um, what do you think? Is that a good idea? Uh, I haven't heard about um, um, the, these plans, but again, educate especially new countries or huge countries like Greater China, mm -hmm. having exhibitions, uh, talking about Swiss craftsmanship, <laughs> again, having their platform to communicate and interact with the end consumers, because here you mainly interact the B2B uh, business. So having something where you interact with consumers, I think it's a good idea, especially in these huge uh, watch and luxury markets like uh, Greater China. We're in Hall 1, so of course Japanese are upstairs. They are not on the, on the ground floor, but they're trying to get back in. I heard they were trying to even get more space and to possibly be on this floor. Do you find that competition from Asia is growing? Do you see them as a threat? No. Neither do I consider Asian competition as a threat. Neither do I consider uh, digital watches as a, as a threat. We, indeed, if you want, it's like in the beverage industry, okay? We all drink either water or Chateau Lafitte. We sell Chateau Lafitte. Uh, mm -hmm. Digital watches are a Coca-Cola, soft drink. Mm -hmm. You can combine both and you drink both. One doesn't exclude the other, but these are totally different markets. Mm -hmm. 
uh, of different products within the same market. I don't think it makes sense to uh, to discuss about how big digital watches are versus the Swiss watch industry. It doesn't make sense. It just that we are totally. It's 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 like in fashion. You cannot compare uh, uh, haute couture with prêt à porter. I mean, would people do that? It doesn't make sense. So you sound like you're like the you're, you're pretty comfortable with the the I, I, I would say the Swiss watch is sitting on the throne at a long term. Um, I don't know if we will always sit on the throne. I think we have the capabilities and the DNA and everything which is necessary to defend that throne if you do it right. The point is not coming back to digital if we're selling digital watches or not. I don't think anybody wants a Swiss watch being digital. It doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. It's about craftsmanship. It, uh, craftsmanship. It's about emotions, etc. The point is then how do you interact with the consumer in selling that analog product? Yeah. And here you have to become digital. Yeah. How do I talk to you? How do I interact with you? How do I do the after sales service with you? How do I do um, um, uh, omni-channel uh, sales from boutiques to retail to e-commerce? All that part has to become digital. The product per se uh, can stay uh, analog. And I think in this digital world, by the way, that mm -hmm. analog will become the new luxury. Because, you know, it's, it's an overkill. You know, you have... Mm -hmm. uh, digital okay. information all the time mm -hmm. and um, and there are many people, young people, millennials who uh, who either don't want digital watches or are absolutely ready to buy both, which mm -hmm. is fine. Yeah, there's a bit sort of a vintage thing maybe that will start coming towards analog. You know, they'll be seeing it as millennials, I mean. Yeah, Seeing absolutely. it as kind of like a modern retro retro, thing. Modern, it's exactly yeah. what we are doing uh, at Brighting with our products and when I see you know, the success of our re-edition from 1959, it's phenomenal, the digital response we had on a product which is that old and that traditional, because this is reassurance in a probably uh, overload, digitally overloaded uh, environment of, of humanity. But you are going into this omni-channel yes. um, idea, so Absolutely. somehow you are feeding but still again, into this digital Again, we have to differentiate the product per se mm. and how we talk to the consumer. If we don't talk in a with, with social media, if we don't embrace um, omni-channel uh, and allow the consumer to buy when and where he wants, okay. then you have a problem. But that doesn't relate to the product. The product, in my opinion, at least for the Swiss watch industry, has to stay traditional, okay. has to respond to emotions, because you're not selling a commodity here. Time is not a commodity, at least not with Swiss watches. And how are you doing with the online sales? We've just started. Brighton was never um, uh, very digital since the new management took over a year and a half ago. That's the first thing we did. So we uh, launched e-com in the US last beginning of last year. Mm -hmm. uh, no, at the end of last year, and we've launched um, in China, mm -hmm. uh, in collaboration with Alibaba, and now we did the Swiss market and we'll roll out the rest of the markets within the next weeks. But, so far, any... Oh, no, it's going good, it's going good. It's part of it. Again, you have to give the opportunity to the client to buy either in a retail store, at his wholesaler, or online. We work with uh, pure, uh, pure platforms, also e-com pure, pure platforms. Mm -hmm. This is how you call it. This is why we call it omnichannel. And mm -hmm. we have to be omnichannel like in any other industry. And the fashion industry showed the way 10, 15 years ago. And when you are, for example, shipping products of such value like watches that are worth thousands of Swiss francs, I mean, how do you assure that no, they reach sort of their well, destination? A, neither it is a problem, by the way, to sell expensive watches yeah. um, online. Okay. Yeah. So people believe, can you really sell expensive watches? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. Because you have to differentiate between the buying process, mm -hmm. or the thinking process, which might take a year. You look at the watch, you're seeing your retailer, you put on your wrist, etc. And then the purchase itself, which mm -hmm. might take place on a Saturday morning at 2 o'clock. These are two different processes. Mm -hmm. But you can sell that product 
What is very different though uh, with other industries in, uh, in e-com is the concierge service. So uh, people tend to call to talk to the concierge, where can I get it, how can I get it, can I pick it up mm -hmm. at the boutique. So 50%, 60% of actually the e-com sales we generate are through concierge and telephone calls from the client. Interesting. So you're not taking out that middle process. They're Absolutely just giving not. them another tool Absolutely. to acquire Absolutely. the product Absolutely. for their clients. Absolutely. Flexibility uh, is needed. So somehow you don't lose that exclusive feeling of having that watch and delivered by your concierge or whatever. And a personal touch mm -hmm. or he wants to pick it up at one of our boutiques mm -hmm. and still have that, that feeling mm -hmm. that Again, that, that personal touch. All right, we are just finishing up. I just want to ask you just a little bit more on your business summit. So what is the goal with these summits? I mean, can you, again, are you going to be able to buy watches there or is no, it just? No, 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 it's really, it's really about, um, in, in a very powerful way, because it's a very powerful show. It's not a PowerPoint presentation, what we are having in these summits. Okay. So you have, uh, a screen which is 25 meters by 5, we have show elements, we have live acts, we have interviews, and within an hour you explain the brand in a very powerful way, which you cannot do in a, in a, in a, in a booth, it's impossible. So it's, it's a very interactive, powerful, impactful uh, show in a way to explain the brand, where we stand, what we've done, what are the new products, and as I said, next year probably, or even in the second half of the year, there will be another summit, we'll, uh, we'll uh, live stream it, because mm -hmm. it's interesting to engage the customer, not only the retailers or the guests who are in the room, but also to reach out to a wider public. We have nothing to hide. Uh, these products will then be available immediately after the shows. And, and this is how I see the future of, of these kind of platforms. Um, the beauty in Basel or in Geneva is that, every, that you have your retailers here already, so you mm -hmm. can also talk to the retailers. But ultimately, we have to become cust customer-centric. And we need to be less company-centric or B2B-centric. Mm -hmm. We need to orient everything towards the customer. And this is why these shows should be streamed and will be streamed by uh, Brightling in the, in the next, uh, uh, during the next summit. So less B. No, we need Let's B. Be. We need B uh, because uh, they are our, our main partners. It's the last element of the chain. Um, and for them, it's also super important to see it and to understand. It's a kind of training. Mm -hmm. And they understand the brand. And at the end of the day, they, they also have to tell the story to their consumers. Uh, but it's both. Um, and it's not B2B or B2C. It's both, and you have to use all the channels mm -hmm. in in an optimal way. Speaking of which, uh, growth in Asia is always a focus for, for Swiss watches and, and for Breitling also in particular. What are you doing? What is your strategy looking at Asia? Because the Hong Kong watch fair is now bigger than Basel World. Yeah. So. The, um, okay, the situation at Brighton is, is a little different because for some reason Brighton was never really present in Greater China. Uh, Brighton is super strong in the top three, top four brands in the US, in the UK, in Japan, but not in Greater China for many reasons. But anyway, we've addressed it now. Mm -hmm. But I'm not worried at all. Why? For a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, we are much quicker than 10 or 15 years ago you to digital. So you communicate in a much quicker way your products. Uh, the market is much more transparent, so the Chinese know exactly what is successful outside of China. And you cannot be successful in China without being successful in the States and in Europe. The third thing, the market is pivoting, and this new generation buying watches now don't want to buy the watches of their parents what they bought 15 years or 20 years ago when the market opened. Therefore, suddenly, sports watches, bigger watches, cooler watches, mm -hmm. and not the typical classic three-hand watches, mm -hmm. become attractive. Mm -hmm. And we see it in our, our uh, sales figures. We've just opened 
roughly 30 doors now, we have to open another uh, 70 doors minimum. In but China? We, yeah, in China. But we see, whoops, suddenly uh, Chinese people are buying uh, bulkier watches, mm -hmm. cooler watches, and going away from these traditional first movers in the Chinese markets you saw 10, 15 years ago. So mm -hmm. I'm not worried because the market is transparent, we can communicate very quickly through digital channels, mm -hmm. and the market pivoted it also in terms of taste. In spite of, I guess, the global slowdown we're seeing. There's, for sure, there is overall in the market certainly a kind of slowdown, but I'm not worried. You know, when you look at the uh, wealth in the world, right. if I look at the GDP in the US, um, if I look at the phenomenal potential in China with 300 million customers being able to buy these type of watches uh, within the next five to ten years, the potential is mm -hmm. huge in India. So mm -hmm. on the long term, I'm not worried at all. You always have um, you know, dips because of Brexit, trade wars, right. etc., etc. Okay, we have to live with it like any other industry in the world. Right. Well, Swiss watches are, seem to be doing well pre-Brexit. You know, the, the exports were up in the UK this last month, so... Um, yeah. Uh, first of all, we're not part of the EU, so we're less impacted okay. uh, than, uh, than, I don't know, the, the German car industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have our relationship with, uh, with, uh, with the UK. Um, the only issue we have are the exchange rates. It's how the pound will, will uh, evolve. Is it going down, up? And mm -hmm. then we'll have to adjust the prices and how mm -hmm. all this will impact the tourism uh, from Europe, from the States, and from China. And nobody knows what is going to happen. Right, right, right. But I think even outside of Brexit, those are concerns that the watch industry always faces, right? The currency and tourism and... Um, but what is funny, I mean, I've been, I've been in this industry for 25 years now. What is, fu what is, um, what is really uh, interesting is that the industry recovers very quickly. I've never seen, for instance, after Lehman Brothers, mm -hmm. I've never seen such a quick recovery. It was within six to eight months. Woof. Because it's, you know, rich people will always be there. They are, they're not disappearing. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's, the luxury industry is very psychological. If you don't feel good, mm -hmm. even if you have the money on your account, you don't buy. And uh, as soon as things are good, doing better, okay, let's spend that amount of money. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's not, you know, it's in, in your Maslow pyramid, it's not something you need mm -hmm. for living. So it's, it's really a reward, it's something you want to give for an occasion. And if you feel good, you buy products. And if you don't feel good, or if the environment is not positive, then suddenly the market is going down. And all these issues of trade wars with US, China, etc., were certainly a negative problem, but it will disappear. It will disappear. And these guys, again, still have money on their account, and they will buy a watch to know later. You've already priced all these things in, it sounds like, <laughs> the way the market does. It's, you know, again, I mean, we've, we went through many crises and problems over the last uh, uh, 20 years with digital watches. Every industry is disrupted. You have economic environment issues. You have social crises. You have natural disasters in Japan, etc. We have to live with it.